Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. It's a joy to be with you. Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. have been studying the Sermon on the Mount, and we have been preaching through these Beatitudes of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And today we come to the final Beatitude, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Let's read. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 1. And listen with me at how these Beatitudes crescendo. They get louder and louder until we get to this last Beatitude today. We sit now at the feet of Jesus, just like his disciples years ago on that mountain. Chapter 5, verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Amen. Lord, your words, your words, your words, Lord, write them on our heart. Help us see your blood and help us see your resurrection today, Lord. Amen. Each of these Beatitudes as we've said, has in it a paradox and a promise. Here the paradox gets more extreme and the promise gets more heavenly. The paradox is this. Blessed are the persecuted. Think about it, Christian. How could that be true? That's a paradox. That's you could say almost, it looks like a contradiction in terms. How could you say, blessed, happy are those who are persecuted? How does that work? And then the promise comes, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And more is added in verse 12. 
For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets who were before you. So the paradox gets more extreme. And the promise gets more glorious and more heavenly. You'll also notice in verse 11 that Christ's address to us gets more intimate. Note that he's been just throwing these beatitudes out into the air. Blessed are this type of people. Blessed are this type of people. Blessed are this type of people. And now what does he do in verse 11? Blessed are you. Blessed are you. Blessed are you. He looks directly at us. And he says, this is you. This applies to you. It's so beautiful. Let's talk today about blessed persecution. Blessed persecution. And let's see if we can wrap our minds around this incalculable, glorious blessing that comes from being hated in this world. I have three questions for us today. What is persecution? What forms do persecution does persecution take? And finally, how should we react to persecution? And we're just going to go right through this text. Verse 10, verse 11, and verse 12. And we'll try to study every word together. Let's start with this question. What exactly is persecution? Look in verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. The Greek word literally means to be pursued, to be hunted down, or to be chased. So I think of when I used to go out with my cousin Mark and my cousin Eric and we take a little jar in our hands and we go hunt for newts and salamanders in the woods and we'd overturn every rock every stone every leaf every bit of bark and you turn it over and you look for those little orange things you throw them in the jar we were doggedly pursuing them through the whole forest that's persecution it means pursuit. It means hunting them down, chasing after. It's the same word that's used in Greek for hunting. When you go hunting, you're persecuting, you're pursuing. Now, that's the general idea. A.T. Pearson, good old scholar, uh, he said, when we study a term in the Bible, we want to use the law of first appearance. The law of first appearance. That means we should go to the first place in the Bible where that term appeared. So let's just turn briefly with me to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. And I want to give you just two passages here that help us lock down the definition of persecution. Genesis chapter 3. Verse 15 is often called the first gospel, the Proto-Evangelio. This is an amazing passage where after Adam and Eve have sinned, the Lord God visits them graciously in the garden, and he rebukes their sin, and he also preaches the gospel. Now in verse 15, this is the Lord Christ himself appearing and he preaches Christ we have the Lord Christ preaching Christ to Satan he preaches the gospel right in the face of the power of darkness right here this is the first gospel preached and it's the first mention of persecution in the Bible so let's look at this beautiful passage very briefly Christ preaching Christ to Satan Imagine that. He says, verse 15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, 
and between thy seed and her seed. What does that mean? There's the seed of the devil and the seed of the woman. And right there he promises there will be a war between those two. We can even say that war will go on throughout human history. The seed of the devil and the seed of the woman will be at war. And then what does it say? Here's the gospel in a nutshell. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Okay, the first phrase there is very important. This seed of the woman is Christ. And here the Lord says, This seed, Christ, shall bruise Satan's head. Where does that happen? On the cross. Where Christ destroyed the works of the devil. Amen? He bruised the head of Satan. And what does that head there mean? It means he got him right where it counts. He shot him right in the head. He bruises the head. The very authority and power of Satan crippled. Destroying the works of the devil. And then what does it say? And thou shalt bruise his heel. Satan shall bruise Christ's heel. That's the first promise of the gospel in the whole Bible. That's the promise that the Old Testament saints would believe. And that's the first mention of persecution right there. That Satan would pursue and bruise the heel of Christ and his body. <clears throat> Can you all see that in outline? Just little shadows of, of persecution right there. I spent the last few days with my niece, Amelia, and we would walk on the streets of Boston, and I would walk in front of her, and she'd walk behind me, and she'd just like scuff my shoes, right? She'd step on the back of my shoes. I said, what are you doing, May? What are you doing? And she'd, go, she'd just chuckle, and then she'd back up, and we'd keep walking, and she'd <laughs> try to get my shoes off again, oh, and she'd God. chuckle and keep walking. What was she doing? Just bruising my heel. Just a little touch, just trying to get my shoe off, right? That's what Satan does right here to Christ and to the body of Christ. He bruises our heel. That's the first mention of persecution in the whole Bible. I want us to have this general uh, definition of persecution. You could write this down if you like. Persecution is this. The defeated seed of the devil raging against the victorious seed of Christ. Listen to that again. The defeated seed of the devil raging against the victorious seed of Christ. And I tell you that that is promised right here in Genesis 3.15. And I also want to proclaim this to you. That reality goes on throughout human history. And that reality will be with us until Christ returns again. The defeated seed of the devil... The powers of darkness know that they're defeated and they rage and they foment against Christ and against his body. But they're raging against a victorious seed, against the victorious church of Christ. Amen? So what then do we see in chapter 4 of Genesis? We see Cain slaying Abel. What's that? Persecution. What do we see then in the life of David? He gets hunted down, even by his own son, right? What's that? Persecution. The seed of Christ, the people of Christ, are being hunted. We go to the year 303. From 303 to 311, the emperor Diocletian mercilessly hunted down the people of God. And he burned them at the stake and he tried to exterminate them entirely. And he got rid of so many Bible manuscripts, almost an entire Christian library. What do we call that? 
persecution. We go to the 1550s and you see a man named John Knox who was taken in a French galley ship and was made to serve there for two years in excruciating circumstances with the waves of the sea lapping over him because of these Catholics who had tied him to this boat. What do we call that? Persecution. And then what happened in Knox's life, it's, it's amazing to watch. He flees to Geneva. And then he flees to England. And then the forces come after him. And then he flees to Scotland. And the forces come after him. And he goes back to England. What do we call that? Persecution. He's on the run. The forces of darkness are after him. And then zoom forward with me to 2020 and Canada. And you see Canadian pastors being jailed because they try to keep their churches open. What do we call that? Persecution. Or throughout the whole history of the church, you see a young woman become a new Christian. And she goes to the table with her family and tries to tell her family about what's happened to her and that Jesus saved her soul. And the family says, we're not going to talk about religion here. We don't talk religion and politics. What do you call that? Persecution. Persecution. It's the same phenomenon. Or you see the Christian who stands up for truth in his church, who maybe says, well, why are those people on the worship team if they don't even profess Christ? And the church even could drive those people out. What do you call that? Persecution. We need to have this general definition of persecution. It is the defeated, crippled seed of Satan hunting down the totally victorious Church of Christ. Think of all those little examples I just gave you. All of them are persecution. All of them in the moment, I'm sure, felt very painful and very sad. But all of them were glorious. All of those examples made the Church of Christ shine more and more. Amen? That's persecution. It's important that we have a broad definition of persecution. It's important that we realize that there is no timeline on persecution in the Bible. Because we can make two errors when it comes to persecution. And listen very closely to me. One is that we can have this sort of view of the end times where persecution is going to get so bad that the church will just be defeated. That's completely wrong and completely unbiblical. The church is always victorious. The head of the devil has already been bruised. Amen? Amen. And then there's another error we can make where we can say that persecution is going to lessen as church history goes on, or that persecution will even take different forms as church history goes on. That also is not right. What we want to assert is that persecution is a reality for every child of God throughout every generation until Jesus Christ comes. And if you don't believe that, let me prove it to you with one other passage, just while we're defining persecution here. Turn quickly to 2 Timothy and chapter 3. 2 Timothy and chapter 3. <clears throat> Second Timothy chapter 3. And I'm using this passage to give us a balanced view of persecution. And I believe this passage proves that persecution will go on throughout the entire church age and that there's no promise that it will lessen or that it will change form throughout the entire church age. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This also know that in the last days perilous times shall come. That's in the whole church age. Perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, 
boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. That's persecution. And then go to verse 9. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. Oh, praise God. No, look at that verse. That says that at some point, either on judgment day, or as God is meeting out his judgment throughout church history, the folly of those people will be made known. Evil will be exposed. And then verse 10, Paul writes to Timothy, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. But listen, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. You see that balanced view of persecution we're getting? Yes, persecutions come, but they're always exposed, and we are delivered from all of them. And then look at what Paul says, verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's a promise for every Christian throughout the entire church age. Persecution will be a reality. Verse 13, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And that's a promise that evil and evil men will remain throughout this church age. Why am I harping on all this? I want us to have this balanced view where we say and we understand that persecution is not going anywhere. We have no promise that it will lessen or change form, but we are also always persecuted by a defeated foe. We are always persecuted by a defeated foe, and we are always triumphant. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's go back to Matthew chapter 5. Look again at verse 10. Matthew 5 verse 10. He says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let me just ask a few more questions about this text. Who does the persecuting here? In the Greek, it's just they. They do the persecuting. So verse 10, we're persecuted. Verse 11, it says, Blessed are ye when they shall revile you. It's just some unknown they. Verse 12, at the end it says, For so persecuted they, the prophets. Who's that they? Well, it is the forces of darkness throughout human history. So we ought to look to be persecuted by ungodly people, by Satan, by demons, by lost humans. And I ask you this, could we ever even be persecuted by a professing Christian? Yes. It could be a possibility that either a Christian is so confused that they would go after another Christian or someone is just a nominal Christian and therefore they go after another Christian in the church. I think it's important to see that those persecuting here are just a they. And that they stands for that defeated seed of Satan. Now, I know this is a lot to take in, but I want us to have a balanced view of persecution. One more question we have right here. Why in this passage are we persecuted? Look at verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. So are we persecuted uh, because we're jerks? Anybody? No. No. <laughs> Uh, if people come after us and want to shut us down, 
because we're just being a bunch of loudmouth jerks. Is that true persecution? No. 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 Yes. We are persecuted for what? For righteousness sake. Amen. And then also look in verse 11. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely. Why? For my sake. For my sake. Amen. When we are persecuted, when people come against us, we ought to check our hearts and say, why is this? Are they coming against me because I'm standing up for Jesus Christ? Then we say, Amen, let it come. But if it's, maybe they're coming against me because I'm actually acting hateful, or I'm actually acting like a jerk, then that's not persecution, and we ought to be meek and humble ourselves. Amen? Amen. Some also look around in today's society and say, well, Christians aren't actually being persecuted, not much is happening. And I think the test right here for that is simply to say, well, then go do something explicitly Christian and see if you get persecuted or not. Go confess the name of Jesus Christ in your workplace or on the street and see if you get persecuted or not. We're persecuted for righteousness sake, for his sake. Stand up for him. Be godly. And it will come. And when it does come, our Lord says, you're blessed. That was our first question. Second question, what forms does persecution take? Now we'll look at verse 11. What forms does persecution take? And this is so important. Because Christ never tells us to compare different forms of persecution. To say, oh, well, John Knox was hunted down, and I'm not being hunted down by the Catholics right now, so I'm not as godly or something like that. No. Christ gives us four different forms of persecution, and he simply wants us to be prepared for all of them. Look at verse 11 with me, and we'll go through these rather quickly. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you. That's the first form of persecution. And that is persecution from the heart. What's reviling? It's when something just wells up in someone's heart and they say, I hate you. Very often when we've been on the street on Friday at the abortion clinic, people will just turn on you. They don't touch you. They don't do anything to harm your body. But they'll say something to you like, well, I wish you were. Ordered. They'll say something like that. And if you, all you're seeing is their heart reviling you. It's, it's pure, unadulterated hatred from the heart, but there might not be any physical com consequences. Reviling. Persecution from the heart. That's the first form. What's the second one? Men shall revile you and persecute you. He repeats that term. That is persecution in action. That is when people are literally hunting you down to bring you down. The word in Greek also is when you bring someone before the bar in the law court. You say, I'm going to catch you and I'm going to bring you to the lawyer. Right? I'm going to bring you to the judge. Here I think of our beloved covenanters in the 1600s in Scotland where they and their entire families were hunted on mountains. And there was a man named Claverhouse, right? Who was really one of the most evil men who's ever, ever existed. And his horse was named Satan. And he was a, a prelate. He had sort of Anglican and Catholic sympathies. And he would ride through the mountains and look for entire families of covenanters. He was paid to exterminate them, to those who held to the Westminster Confession of Faith. Just wipe them out. That's what our Lord speaks of here. Persecution. That's physical persecution. Okay? That's the second form. Third form. And shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. 
This is persecution of the tongue. Persecution of the tongue. Or you might call it slander. I would encourage you all at some point in your Christian life to study the Welsh revivals. The Welsh revival, really. It was one revival. 1904 to 1905. And that revival came really through one man. Does anyone know his name? What's that? Evan Roberts. Evan Roberts. He was a tall man who worked in the coal mines. And he devoted about a decade of his life, when he was in his teens and his 20s, to praying for revival. He said that he became obsessed with the idea of revival. And he would pray for it even in his breaks in the coal mines, every day for a decade. God graciously then brought revival to Wales, and when it came, it was this glorious, huge outpouring, thousands and thousands being saved. And Evan Roberts has a wonderful life, because you see him in those years of revival, just almost retreating. People would seek him out and try to take pictures of him and put him in the newspaper and whatnot, and he actually said, only my family can take pictures of me. And he would retreat, and oftentimes he'd come to a service and only pray, because people were just looking for this famed preacher. He retreated more and more. Let me just tell you this. In 1905, a man named Peter Price wrote an article against Evan Roberts, and he slandered him mercilessly. He wrote some of the most slanderous and mean stuff against this man who had been devoted to revival for 10 years of his life. He said stuff like this. He called the revival a sham, a mock revival. He called it mere froth, vain trumpery. And this was in the, 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 like the Portland Press Herald, right? The, the, the papers of the day in Wales. He called it utterly sacrilegious bogus and he said that Evan Roberts was posing as the fourth person of the Trinity he just tore him down he tore him down and I'll tell you a bit more about that in a moment it actually caused Evan Roberts to be a recluse for the rest of his life he retreated what is that called that's called slander it's persecution of the tongue and here our Lord tells us to expect that too. Look at it one more time. What does he say? They shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Note that our Lord adds that word there, falsely. It's like Jesus is speaking in our ears and he's whispering to us. And in Greek, it's a little participle right there. It, it, it would sound something like this. Right? So they're, they're slandering, they're slandering. And Jesus says, they shall say all manner of evil against you, lying for my sake. Isn't that amazing? He reminds us in this little drive-by word there, that they're lying. Remember that they're lying. Their slander is a lie. Amen? Amen. And let me just tell you, in Luke chapter 6, verse 22, our Lord adds a fourth type of persecution. He says in Luke chapter 6, verse 22, and men shall separate you. Okay, so what have we seen? There's persecution from the heart, persecution in action, persecution of the tongue or slander, and finally, there's persecution in the form of censure meaning people will separate us and push us to the side. Now, I think a lot of that is going on right now, no? The YouTube platform, it will censure Christian content and just yeah. put it to the side. That's what our Lord promises in Luke 6, verse 22. They shall separate you. They'll push you to the side. On Twitter, similar things can happen. When we see these regulations of free speech, what is that? It's censuring Christians, pushing them off to the side. So those are the four major forms of persecution that our Lord puts before us. 
The Bible, listen, does not encourage us to compare these forms of persecution. It never encourage us, encourages us to say, that one's worse, that one's better, that one will come toward the start of the church age, that one will come toward the end of the church age. It never says anything like that. Our Lord just wants to prepare us to say, those four types of persecution will come to you if you speak up for righteousness and if you act in my name. He wants us to know that that is our faith if we are Christians. Amen? Final point. How should we react to persecution? And this we find in verse 12. This verse is so relieving, so beautiful, so comforting. So look at it with me for just a few more moments. Verse 12, rejoice and be exceeding glad. There is where the paradox of this, of this beatitude comes out in its fullness. And if we're even honest with ourselves, we should say, how in the world could I rejoice when someone persecutes me? Let's look at these words for a moment. Rejoice is the Greek word for greeting. Literally, our, our Lord is saying this. Here comes persecution, and you should say, Howdy. Howdy. Hi. Hello again. You're back, persecution. Good to see you. I was expecting you. My Lord promised you to come to me. Do you all see that? The Greek word right here is kairete. It's when a, when a, Greek, word, a Greek person says to another Greek person, hi. That's what our Lord is telling us to do. Here comes persecution. Greet it. And then next it says, and be exceeding glad. The word right there is a word for jumping for joy. And again, in uh, it's Luke chapter 6, verse 23, our Lord adds the word leap for joy when persecution comes. Both of those words are used in Greek for what my dad called recently the quickening. You all heard of that? When a baby is being formed in the womb and there's something called the quickening? No? That, yes, amen. That's when the baby starts kicking, right? These two Greek words right here are used for that. He's telling us, kick around, leap for joy, jump. There was one time on Friday, right, brother, where we were meeting some heavy opposition at Planned Parenthood. And we all left feeling very discouraged. And we said, wait a second. Jesus tells us to literally leap for joy. And so we tried to do that little thing. We go, boom, 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 like that. And you leap. We should. We should say, that's how he tells us to react. Joy, rejoicing, greet it. Like your old friends coming around the corner again. Let me just give you two examples of people doing this well or not so well. Again, in 1905, Evan Roberts saw multitudes saved in the Welsh Revival. Multitudes. Peter Price writes this slanderous, scathing article that takes Evan Roberts down. And this is the thing you want to study in his life. I believe he was a man of God. I believe he was fully surrendered to God and God was able to use him in the Welsh Revival. But he was very young and he was somewhat immature. And all of us young men here, we should be cautious of this. Because when Peter Price came against Evan Roberts, Evan Roberts said, okay, I'm shutting up shop, and I'm just going to hide in a room until I die. He did not heed what our Lord says right here. And someone should have gone to Evan Roberts, and I believe many did, and should have said, look, you got persecuted because you stuck your neck out for Jesus' sake. You should rejoice. People would visit him 30 years later, 40 years later, and he was just alone in his room, often just living in someone else's apartment, alone. 
So that's maybe not heeding Christ's advice in verse 12. But I want to tell you about someone who did heed Christ's advice in the most marvelous way. There was a covenanter named John Brown of Priest Hill, a beautiful man, a godly man, a simple man. He didn't do that much by way of preaching, but he started little Bible studies in his home for the other farmers who were around him. John Brown of Priest Hill. And many young men would come and study with him, just in his little cabin. There was one day where that evil man, Claverhouse, came on his big horse. And he came riding through the fog. They called it the Misty Morning. Claverhouse was looking for a man named Alexander Peden. Peden was called the prophet of the the covenant. Peden was a Westminster confessor, but he was a continuationist to the full. He saw visions. He prophesied. He told people what was going to happen next week, and it was true, and they fled, and it was incredibly helpful. Peden, the prophet of the covenant, knows that Claverhouse is coming somehow, so he flees. And Claverhouse opens up John Brown of Priest Hill's door. I can't tell you what he does to John Brown of Priest Hill, but he persecutes him in the worst way imaginable to the death. I won't mention what he did in this company. Claverhouse then looks at Isabel Priest, Isabel Brown, his dear, dear wife. And he, he said to her, this evil man, he said, what now do you think of your fine husband? And she said, I ever thought much good of him, yeah. and more than ever now. She just said that in the face of this evil man. She said, I love him even more now. And you can almost hear that Andrew Peterson song playing, Rejoice, my love, and call me blessed. In death, my love, I loved you best. What did Isabel Brown of Priest Hill do? She said, we're persecuted. My husband has just been killed for Christ's sake. And I rejoice. And I love him more. And you know what she did? She just continued to train up her kids in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And she lived for Jesus the rest of her days. A humble, godly woman alone in that cabin but just going on why because she did what Christ said right here rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven amen beautiful story just a few more thoughts here what's our incentive to rejoice when we are persecuted we're going to get a reward in heaven. We were just at a family reunion and some people gave us little gifts. And it was so wonderful. We appreciate them. Do you all consider that Christ right now is making up little gifts for you in heaven? You might receive a white stone. Or you might receive a new name when you get to heaven. He's... He's making up these little precious things, these precious rewards that he's going to give to you because you lived for him. It's amazing. And then what does he say? For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. I've told you about many people throughout church history who were persecuted today, haven't I? I could mention more, but time fails to mention Samson and Jephthah and what happened to Isaiah when they sawed him in asunder? We're part of that number. And if we get persecuted, we should say, they did it to the prophets before us, and I want to be in that number. I want to be one of them. I want to be with them. That's what our Lord says right here. Let me give you three simple points of application to take home. Please, brothers and sisters, train yourselves to expect 
persecution. Christ promises it to every Christian always. I don't know what form it's going to come to you or to me, but our Lord promises it. And we ought to rejoice and be exceeding glad. Second, train yourself to see all forms of persecution as impotent. Every time we are persecuted, it's coming from the, the powers of darkness that have been destroyed at the cross. Destroyed in the resurrection. Destroyed when our Lord came out of that grave and arose on the last day and ascended to the right hand of his Father on high. Amen? These forms of persecution, as they come to us, they come from impotent powers of darkness, and they will only serve to make us shine. Finally, train yourself to react with exceeding joy. If you have been persecuted recently, if you are going to be persecuted, train yourself, even if you look like a fool, to do this. <laughs> Jump for joy. Seriously. Train yourself to do that. That's what our Lord says right here. Greet it. Rejoice. Be exceeding glad. You're doing it for him. Lord, we thank you for your precious word and your clear word. And we ask you, Lord, to tattoo these lessons on our heart. And to never let us forget what you've done for us, and what we ought to do for you. Help us, Lord, to confess you openly and to jeopardize our lives on the high places of the field until you come back. Lord, you ask us, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? I pray that you will, Lord. Amen.